And so Bill, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you for serving. And I want to say thank you for years of walking with integrity and being that example to young people, a uh, person like myself and um, so many others. Not only, you know, you started well, but you're, you're, you're running your race with integrity. And so I wanted to ask you, how many years you have been in ministry now, in a full-time ministry? Full-time, we've been uh, f about 15 years, and part-time, seven years. Before that. Right. Mm -hmm. What is the one thing that you would share to a younger Bill, the one who's just starting? What would you tell him? You know, I think it's, you know, all of us want to do more for God, right? Uh -huh. We always want to be doers, which is good. But I think it's more important to spend time with the Lord personally, like rising in the morning and praying and reading and just spending quality time with the Lord. You know, even Billy Graham said, if he could do it over, he would do one thing. He would do less travel and more time with, with wow. Jesus. And so we don't want to lose sight of being with the Father, of being with Jesus, mm -hmm. and being in uh, fellowship with him. So sometimes we get so busy that we put that off. And it's really important to spend that time. And if you can develop the habit of getting up early and reading and praying first thing, it's such a difference. It makes your day go smoothly. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the days that I'm in a rush, you know, you, the day gets messed up and so forth. So. And that's my second question is, how is, does your time look like with the Lord? Well, I, we get up early, my wife and I, and we... You know, personal question, what time do you get up? Oh, what time? It varies, to be honest with you. Usually. Uh, about six. Very early. Okay, about wow. About six. That's I early. used to get up earlier, but now, I don't know, I get up about six, so... <laughs> But it depends on if we're even uh, if we're, if we're mm -hmm. traveling or not. You know, uh -huh. if we're traveling, then it's a lot different. You're up late. You got to be at church yeah. in the morning and all that. So, mm -hmm. and your time with the Lord, what does that consist of for you? I, I uh, first I like to read the Word, and so I read, and then I read about 500 scriptures that I try to keep in my head. So I read all of those, and then um, I pray for a list of the people that we pray for family and different ones that we've been standing for that are uh, fighting cancer and different things. Mm -hmm. And then um, my wife and I get together after we each have our separate time when we get together and we pray together. Okay. So that's, oh. that's our routine in the morning. What is your secret of your health? Somebody asked the question, they said, you are 70, you look like you're 50, you don't have gray hair. What is the secret of that? I mean, it's definitely your wonderful marriage, presence of God, but there are some practical young things. Wife. That you're, <laughs> young wife. Young wife, but what are some practical things that you are doing to stay in shape, healthy, and full of energy? Because somebody said that leaders' greatest asset is not even their gift, it's their energy. Yeah, that's true. What that's is your true. secret? You know, I try to combine everything together. The main thing is the Word of God. If you take the Word literally, you know, uh, Proverbs 4.22 says, uh, his word is health to all our flesh. Mm -hmm. So the more word you read, the healthier your flesh is going to be. Amen. Amen. Okay. And um, yeah, it's true. But there's also many attitudes in the Bible that tell us how to act. Uh, envy rots your bones. If you gossip, it'll go down to the innermost parts of your belly. It'll mm -hmm. cause belly problems. If you have affairs, it'll strike your liver and all these different things. Wow. So you can learn through the word to be obedient to what God says to avoid a lot of the pains that people go through in life. Mm -hmm. So attitude is first, I'd say, uh, living godly, uh, reading his word, getting more word in you. You know, David said in Psalms 119.11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And sin brings forth death. Mm -hmm. So you want to drive out sin out of your life to have life. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you know, to eat right. Now it takes discipline to eat right. But you, you know, people think, oh, I like the junk food, I like this, I like the soft drinks and the hamburgers and all that. But if you get used to eating healthy, eating the good of the land, like the Bible says, mm -hmm. you won't like any of that food anymore. Mm -hmm. you, you change your taste. It's, it really does change. And so you've got to develop that habit, though, and eat right. And you've got to do it now while you're young. Because if you don't, when you get older, you just end up like most people with lots of different things wrong with them. So you can avoid a lot of that by your disciplines now, eating right, and then of course, you know, working out, doing a, a program of exercise. When was the last time you drank soda? When I was 12. 
I, I don't drink any soft drinks or um, hamburgers or white bread. Or How many times nothing. have you drink coffee in your life? I've never had coffee, so. Uh, <laughs> I'm more shocked about this than about the health part, okay? So. <laughs> I, I know I'm a little strange, but, you know, I don't know. I, I, no, I just is, love health. I want to be healthy and strong and be able to powerful. run the race my whole life. I don't want to have aches and pains uh -huh. and wow. I don't want any of that. I'm, I want to stay young. So. Wow. Wow. Come on. That, that deserves a... Anybody wants to line up for deliverance right now? <laughs> a spirit of sugar and soda and, uh, and that's... And coffee. Bill thinks the coffee's Coffee's okay good. though. That's really, right. it's not bad. Just say it. Yeah. I just don't like the taste of it. Mm. But, uh, oh, okay. That's just... You're okay. <laughs> My wife drinks it once in a while, so... Sometimes. <laughs> Bill, how long have you been married? 20, I'm coming up on 24 years. Come on. That's, yeah. that's a veteran right there. And the, the biggest the, secret of, that you've learned in the last 20 or so years of being happily married. And I've seen, you know, your wife, she's a supporter of you. Both of you do this ministry together. Uh, for people who want to do ministry together as a couple, what would you tell them? And who's starting out? Well, your wife is always right, number one. <laughs> Don't argue with it. No, but really, um, we're just a great team together in a sense of, um, because we pray together a lot, that makes a big difference. When you're spiritually connected, mm -hmm. uh, then everything else flows together. And so I, I, there would be no ministry without my wife. She's amazing. I'm, God's really blessed me. But just staying together, close, and... Um, Staying in the word together mm -hmm. uh, keeps, it, keeps it all going in the right direction. Somebody said, I think it was Tommy Tanya's dad, he says that the secret to his longevity in marriage was to keeping his mouth shut and his wallet open. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, happy wife, happy life. Happy yeah. wife, happy life. Come on, somebody. You just released a new book, Recession Proof Living, where you talk not just about the this the, the hell and the, and the eternity but you also talk about some practical things that you've learned through the scriptures to see success in everyday life because God doesn't just want us to go to heaven he wants us to live his principles out somebody said that the presence of God brings peace in our life but the principles of God they bring prosperity they bring God's provision they bring God's success would you expound more on that what is why should everybody read this book and what are the secrets that you've learned if you can share a few of them and some of the stories from this book sure well, this is book is not about hell at all it's about my real estate career, what God taught me of how to be successful in life and how to apply the Word of God to every situation, to take it literally and apply it to no matter what you're going through. So I share 35 true stories about I would not have made the sale if I didn't do what God told me to do. I had to obey the Word and then God showed up. Um, I, I, just to give an example maybe, uh, there's many of them, but... Um, I had a couple that I sold a home to. It was a fixer-upper, needed a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know anything about fixing up a house. I did. I helped them. They bought it. I helped them for six months, remodeled the whole house. I did all that for free. I didn't, it wasn't my job. But at the end, they were thrilled. They were a Christian couple. And about six months later, I get a call on my machine, back in the days when you had the phone machine, mm -hmm. and they left a the machine saying, we hate your guts. You sold us a home in a neighborhood where people get robbed. Our house was broken into last night, and you should have told us we live in a terrible neighborhood, and we're going to slander you all over the neighborhood. So I called them up, and I said, guys, I live a few doors away from you. I'm living in the same neighborhood. It's a nice neighborhood. It, there is very rare. I'm so sorry you got broken into, mm -hmm. but any house can be broken into, you know. Anyway, they said, well, we hate you. We're going to slander you to everybody. And they did. They put out a letter about how bad I was and so forth in the neighborhood that I sold homes in and I lived in. And so, but the Lord told me, just forgive them and send them a $200 bouquet of flowers. So I did, and I sent a note saying, I'm so sorry for your loss. I hope you come to know that this is a nice neighborhood. Well, another six months went by, and I got another call. They were in a church service that day, and the pastor was teaching about love and forgiveness. And it convicted their hearts, and they said, man, we were ugly to him, and he was nice to us. Wow. And now we have found out since this is a nice neighborhood. Wow. So they called me, and he said, Bill, we're so sorry. Would you forgive us? I said, I forgave you six months ago. 
And they said, would you find us? We want a bigger house in the same neighborhood. Would you sell our house and get us a bigger one? So I did. I made two sales. So God prospered me. But I wouldn't have if I wouldn't have been shown love and kindness to them in the first place. So, you know, love never fails. And so that's just one example, but many stories like that mm -hmm. where the word works. If you stand on the word, I don't care what situation you're going through, God will make it work for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? I love, I love how you, yesterday you mentioned that, and even uh, when we talked with you personally, you keep going back to one thing about being led by the Holy Spirit, even in evangelism, even in um, when the Holy Spirit leads you to be a part of the church board or not be a part of the church board, to go or not to go. How important is in your life, your success connected to listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit? I think that's the most important message we could ever hear is how to hear the voice of God. Because we can avoid a lot of life's pitfalls and problems if we could hear his voice. We can avoid a tragedy. That day if you get up and you're praying and you're listening to God's voice and he directs your steps. And then you find out, wow, I, I, he tells you don't go there. And you avoid a problem. So that's crucial. But you've got to spend time with the Lord to hear his voice. It doesn't come automatic. You've got to train your ear to listen to him. You know, and uh, it'll prosper you in so many things. I, I, I could share another story if you want with just, um, uh -huh. uh, again, hearing the uh, uh, Lord's voice. I was selling homes in this neighborhood, and I wanted to list my first house. I hadn't had a, a listing. I was a new kid on the block selling uh, homes, and there were two other competitors against me. And uh, I, I got up in the morning to read and pray like I developed the habit of doing. Well, in the morning... I heard God's voice say, study all the facts and figures to do with your neighborhood. I had not studied all the facts. I knew what that meant. How many miles are there? What's the square footage of each? What, how many acres is a complex and so forth? But I heard God's voice say that to me. And so I did that. That morning, I started studying all the facts and figures. Well, later that day, I get a call from him, my first call saying, I want to interview you to list my house. I'm going to interview two guys after you. And I'm going to piss, pick the best guy. I said, fair enough. So I went over to his house that night, and the first thing he did is said, how many models are there of mine? I said, 41. He goes, how many sold last year? I said, seven. He goes, how many sold this year? I said, four. He goes, what's the square footage? I said, 1992. He goes, how many models are there altogether? I said, six. There's uh, 40 of the plan 303s. There's 35 of the plan 300. I went down the list, and he says, how many acres is a complex? I said, 33. He said, how many acres is our lake? I said, one and a half. He said, how do you know all these figures? I said, it's part of my job. I just learned it that day. <laughs> he says, you got the listing. So I listed it. I walk out the door, and a neighbor's walking by. I lived in the same neighborhood, and a neighbor, and he go, hey, Bill, how you doing? Our friends are over having dinner, and they like our house. Do you have any models that are like ours? I go, yeah, yours is the Plan 303. I just listed one 30 seconds ago. And they said, can we see it? So I turn around, knock on the door, and, they go, and I said, can I show your house? He says, man, you work fast, you know? <laughs> And anyway, the people walked in, they loved it, they bought it right then. So I made 15000 just that fast. And, but the point was, do you think I would have got the listing if he asked me those questions and I couldn't answer them? He would have gone to the other two guys and they would have got the listing. But see how important it was to get up, read. And it says in Job 7, 18, the Lord visits man every morning. Which verse again? Job 7:18. 7, 18. 7, 18, God right visits you every morning. Mm -hmm. And in Ezekiel 12, 8, it says, And the word of the Lord came to me in the morning. Wow. So God comes by to pay a visit to you and will give you a word in the morning. But see, if we sleep in, we'll miss his visit. I thought, I want to get up and I want to meet the Lord. I want a word. One word from God can change your life. Wow. Amen? Come on. Come on. This is good. Come on. Let's give a clap offering to the Lord. This is powerful. Morning. My guy right there, waking up early in the morning. That's, that's whew, powerful. It's so many things God has in his mm -hmm. word that mm -hmm. will bless us and benefit mm -hmm. us. Uh, should I share one more story? Yeah, no? just one more. One yeah, more. Please, please. Yeah, a this, quick one. This, this is good. There, there was a time when I owed, uh, you know, in real estate, you pay wow. your quarterly estimates, taxes. Well, I ended up owing 45000 more than I, than I had been paying. And so the IRS said, you got two weeks to pay it. Well, at this time in my life, I didn't had no money saved. I had any, I had no escrows, no sales, no listings, and I owed forty-five thousand. And they said you got two weeks to come up with the money. Well, that's pretty hard to come up with forty-five thousand in two weeks. So I, I was praying, and I said, Lord, what do I do? And He said, Do Isaiah fifty-eight. 
Well, I know what that was, Isaiah 58 fast, where you take your food and clothes to the poor and take money and put up a homeless person and pray and fast for three days. And then it says, the Lord says, then you will call on me and I will say, here I am, what do you need? That's what it says in Isaiah 58. So that's what I felt led to do. Again, the Spirit, tell me. So the first day of the fast, I'm home, and the phone rings, and it's a client. And he says, Bill, I just called to say hello. And I go, what have you been doing? He goes, well, I've been looking for a home on the ocean. I said, why didn't you call me? He goes, well, you're not an oceanfront specialist. You need to work the ocean to find a place in Laguna Beach, uh, California. you got to know what you're doing there. And I said, well, if I found something for you, would you look? He goes, I've looked for six months. I've looked with all the best agents. I've seen everything. I said, yes, but if I find you something, would you look? And he says, sure, go ahead. So I went out and looked, and I called him up about 10 different houses. He's seen all of them except for one. He said, I haven't seen that one. I said, let's go. So I took him out. We walk in the door. He said, this is it. I'll take it. He says, the only thing is, he says, I'm paying all cash. I need to close it in two weeks. Can you do that? I said, I think I can make that happen. <laughs> so we closed it the 13th day, and my commission was 54000 So it left enough to tithe. And I took the 45000 to the IRS and paid it in one day spare. So now, what if I wouldn't have prayed and done Isaiah 58 and heard the voice of the Lord? What's the odds of him calling me and him telling me he's been looking for a home, me finding him a home that nobody had showed him? Impossible. So God always comes through for you if you trust his word. Highly recommend. We really want to encourage each and every one of you. To get the book, read it. Is it an audible as well? An audio? Uh, no, this one. This one's not. Not an audio. Okay, no. it's gonna happen an audio then very soon. <laughs> and so, but yeah, make sure make sure you read it because it, this will empower you to live your Christian life here on earth and listening. Especially, there will be a fresh hunger and appetite to be led by the Holy Spirit in every single thing of life when it comes to driving relationships, when it comes to your business um, and that. We have a lot of questions about hell, so I'm just going to kind of quickly throw them out. Will Satan reign in hell? What will he be doing? Is he there right now? He's on the earth and in hell. You know, it says Lucifer was cast down to Sheol in Isaiah 14, uh, 11 through 15, that Lucifer was cast down to Sheol. And that's the current hell. But it also says in Revelation 12 that he was cast down to the earth. So it seems to be that he has free reign uh, from hell to the earth to heaven because he's the accuser of the brethren. But after judgment day, he'll be cast into the lake of fire and tormented day and night forever and ever. So the, the concept that Satan reigns in hell right now is not very far-fetched. Well... I, in a sense, he reigns, but not really. God is the one that runs the whole show. And because God appoints those, he, he appoints the hypocrite. He appoints the liar to their rightful place in hell. There are demons there that can torment you, but that doesn't mean they reign and rule. They're just there, and you're in their territory. They have great strength. You have none. So that you can't defend yourself against them, but that doesn't mean they reign in hell. Is hell and lake of fire the same? Well, there's different words for hell, mm -hmm. uh, and Sheol is the Hebrew word for the current hell. Mm -hmm. That's down deep in the earth. Hades is the Greek word. That's the current hell down deep in the earth. Mm -hmm. But uh, the word hell, meaning Gehenna, translated Gehenna, that's the future hell. That's the lake of fire that's in Revelation 20, uh, 12 through 15, mm -hmm. and also in um, Revelation 21, 8. So the lake of fire nobody is in right now. There's no inhabitants. The first mm -hmm. inhabitants are the beast and the false prophet mm -hmm. at the beginning of the thousand years. Where do you think the lake of fire will be? You know, it doesn't say, Jesus said, uh, Matthew 25, 30, uh, cast them into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of mm -hmm. teeth. So where is outer darkness? That sounds like it will be somewhere in deep space, but, mm -hmm. but nobody knows. It, it's, the Bible is not clear where hell will be, you know, after judgment day. Mm -hmm. Did you um, go back and visit hell again after your initial visit that lasted 23 minutes? I did. I had a short visit. Um, I was on my way to the house that we were at the prayer meeting the night before. And on the way, you know, in a day, once you, you know, it's light and you say, this is so crazy. I've been to hell. I, you know, I just said, Lord, would you confirm it? I know I've been there, but I just want some confirmation. If I really saw it, and, uh, then show me, it to me, show me again, just a glimpse of it. When I pulled up at the house, I, and uh, the, the person, he's on the cell phone, and he's waving for me to come in, but just suddenly I was taken out of my body again and dropped down this long tunnel, 
and I peered before this huge pit of fire, and I could see people burning and screaming. It was the same place I was at, but this time I was not a participant. I was just an observer. Mm -hmm. And I was only there 10 seconds, I think, about 10 seconds. And then the Lord pulled me back up that tunnel fast back in my car. I was completely drenched, like I just got out of a swimming pool. I was soaked from, I don't know, the heat or whatever. I don't know, but I was a mess. And I just saw it 10 seconds. And I said, Lord, I don't want to ever see that place again. It shook me up that much just seeing it for 10 seconds. And it might sound like an exaggeration, but if anybody could see it, when I came back in my body after this experience, I was dying. I entered my body, and I knew this physical body cannot hold up under the torments of hell. You've heard of people say they died of fright. It will kill you. It's that serious, you'll just die. And I screamed out, and it woke up my wife, and I said, pray for me, pray for me. Uh, the Lord's taken me to hell. Pray he removes that from my mind. And God took out the horror, but left the memory. Somehow he divided the two, but he can divide both soul and spirit. So he took out that horror or I would have died. And I was in the best physical shape of my life then. That was why I was working out a lot and younger. Did you have nightmares? No, I never that? had any nightmares. The Lord removed all that. I had no nightmares, nothing to do with that. Wow. So that's because God did it, you know. What was your wife's initial response, um, you know, when this happened? Well, at first she thought maybe I was on the floor, she said, rolling in a fetal position, screaming. That's not like me. I'm not mm -hmm. very emotional. Mm -hmm. But um, she thought maybe he's having a heart attack. I don't know. But um, so she started praying and pr started praying in tongues. And then, uh, then I screamed out, pray for me, pray for me. The Lord has taken me to hell. Wow. And so then she prayed and then God removed the horror. So wow. You met people who have had similar experiences. And there's books and there are people who had near-death experiences who've seen, who are not Christians who have traveled through the tunnel and who have seen the light. And yesterday when we discussed that, you had a very um, interesting also explanation. What do you think, because it almost seems like that, it doesn't matter how you live, whether you believe in Christ or not, they, they're all seeing the light and then they come back into their body. How would you explain those experiences? I think there's two possibilities. People that are not saved say they see this light. Well, Ecclesiastes 3 and Ecclesiastes 12 says, when man dies, his soul returns to God. It doesn't say just Christian. It says his soul returns to God. So it's possible that when they die and they're going up, they're heading towards Jesus or an angel. So they're seeing the light. They're seeing light. They really are seeing the truth. But a lot of people that I've talked to that went further, traveled further down up, up, uh, when they got there, then they were pointed by the angel to go down this other path that was a dark road that led to hell. And so a lot of these people, I think they're just not making it that far and they're being deceived thinking they're going to heaven and they're really not. Wow. The other possibility is that Satan appears as an angel of light. So he can appear to you as light. And one man that was an atheist, he said he was dying and he slipped out of his body and he saw this beautiful light and this being that was saying, come here, come follow, come, here, come this way. And so he was following and as he went further, it got darker and darker. And then he knew he was heading to hell. So the, the devil deceives and he appears as an angel of light. So I think that's the two possibilities for these people that are not saved seeing a light. Mm -hmm. Wow. You mentioned how demons would torment people and the scripture talks about demons being tormented in hell. Are they going to be doing both things, being tormented and doing the tormenting or is it just the hell before the judgment where they are tormenting people? I think it's just the hell before the judgment where they're tormenting. You know, Jesus went to cast out a devil in Matthew 8, 29 and the devil said to him, have you come to torment us before the time? So the devil was indicating they're not in torment yet, but have you come to torment us before the time? What time was the devil talking about? Revelation 20.10 at Judgment Day when it says Satan and his demons are cast into the lake of fire to be tormented day and night forever and ever. So that's the time the demon was talking about. That will happen at Judgment Day. So at that time, demons will be in full torment, but many of the commentaries, Matthew Henry and some others point out that the demons are only in partial torment now, but they'll be in full torment later at Judgment Day. Mm -hmm. Wow. Also, um, we have questions that are coming up uh, about salvation, and I want to keep that uh, mainly toward the end. Um, 
one of your students here had a, some good questions too, and I didn't clarify, mm -hmm. but you know, they said, okay, the current hell is down deep in the earth, and it's, it's uh, called Hades. But at the time before Jesus arose from the dead, it was called Sheol, the Hebrew word. That's the place of departing spirits. It was divided by a great gulf fixed, right? Luke 16 says. And the great gulf fixed, the word means gorge or chasm in the earth. So there were two compartments in the Old Testament. There was the torment side and the paradise side. Abraham's bosom the paradise side. So before Jesus died, they were in the two compartments and they could see across a great call fixed. And that's what the rich man was seeing Abraham in his bosom comforted. So after Jesus died, he took all the people out of Abraham's bosom and took them into heaven. Okay, so now it's empty. That compartment's empty. So if somebody, if a believer dies today, they don't go to the good compartment of Hades. They go straight to heaven. Right. Paul said... Um, uh, to, uh, to depart and be with Christ. Or, and uh, he said that, um, oh, what's the other one? He, he, to, uh, to, I'll think of it in a minute. Uh -huh. It was a scripture I had in my yeah, head. Yeah, so when we, when we leave the body, we go straight to yeah, be with the to Lord. Yeah, to be absent from the body is to be, present, be present with the with Lord. The Lord. Mm -hmm. that was it. What about um, if unbeliever dies? They don't go to lake of fire yet. They go into hell, into Hades. Right, they go, like the rich man. Mm -hmm. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment. And the word there, hell, is the word uh, Hades. So if somebody dies, it's not safe. They go directly to Hades, where the person that dies now will go directly to heaven. And we go in our spirit bodies. We don't have our physical bodies yet until the rapture of the church. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then we get our new glorified bodies. Mm -hmm. Remember, like Jesus arose, and he had his glorified body. He could walk through walls, but he could still eat. And he said, handle me. I have flesh mm -hmm. and bones. Mm -hmm. So our glorified body is going to have flesh and bones, mm -hmm. and we'll be able to walk through walls. And he traveled at the speed of thought. Right, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so far, but uh, so we don't have that glorified body yet. We'll get it at uh, the rapture. When somebody is in hell and they're being tormented, and you mentioned how a lot of times you get you get beaten, and maggots eat parts of your body. Does the parts that they eat do they grow back? You know, it's a good question, but I can only tell you what I thought I saw, and it's so dark it's really hard to mm -hmm. see this clearly. But it appeared to me that the people, that their flesh was hanging off their bones and it was burning when the flesh would burn it off. It looked to me that it came back on their body and then it would burn off again. I don't know how it came on. I can't explain that. That's just what it appeared to be. Mm -hmm. But I don't have any scripture to support that. Okay. What about, um, so there are Catholics who believe in purgatory that you can get stuck there and then, you know, through saying, through prayers and through some givings, you can pull people out. So when somebody pretty much goes to hell, there is no way, there's no loophole, there's no uh, crack, there's no other way that you can get out of that place. No. There's only two places and both are eternal. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, these should go into everlasting life and these should go into everlasting punishment. It says the same thing in John 5, 29. Mark 16, 16, Daniel 12, 2, Acts 24, 15, Matthew 13, 30, 13, 41, and 13, 49, all indicate there's only two places. There's not a purgatory, a temporary place you're going to get out. It's permanent once you die, one place or the other. When you went to hell, did you see somebody that you knew? No. You, I, you, I, you couldn't distinguish a man from a woman. Okay. They just look like skeletons. So you, I don't think you'll ever see or identify anybody in hell. Because okay. sometimes people uh, share their experiences and they say, you know, we've seen a lot of pastors there. We've seen a lot of our friends there. And, um, and so I just want, was curious to see. You know, I, you... I, I don't know. Every, some people that have had an experience, mm -hmm. it could be true that God revealed to them a person that okay. they knew. So God can do that in, uh, in, a, in a vision. Mm -hmm. So I can't say for sure that God would not show them someone that they mm -hmm. knew mm -hmm. that's now in hell. Because I met some of the people that I believe they were in hell. And one said he saw his friend that was an atheist and he was in hell burning. So mm -hmm. God could have allowed that. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I watched this. I saw this. I'm not sure how accurate if it's, you probably know this more, where um, these scientists were digging to the center of the earth and they heard the cries and everything. Do you think that that's a true story or do you think that that's a fabrication? Personally, I think it's probably a fabrication. Okay. Uh, I'd like to believe it's true, but uh, you know, back then I, I tried to investigate a little bit, and some people that have said back then 
especially, they could not dig nine miles deep in the earth. The, 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 Scientists the, the, couldn't the, even the, dig that deep. Uh -huh, so the, because the story says that they dig uh, nine miles deep. Right. And they said, well, man's never gotten that deep in the mm -hmm. earth. Mm -hmm. And number two, I don't know if you for sure would hear the screams because hell is a spiritual realm. Just like here, there's angels in this room, okay. but we can't see them. Okay. And they could speak and we couldn't hear them. So well, it's in hell, it's a spiritual realm. It's not realm. necessarily a physical in the center of the earth. It's in the center of the it, earth, but it's not something you can drill into. No, it might be. It might be an actual, I believe it's an actual space. Okay. And it's an actual location, just like it was separated by a great gulf fixed. Mm -hmm. That's a gorge in the earth. So to me, it's definitely a place. Okay. And, um, you know, so I think it's a place. It just inhabits spirits. So, you know, like a house can inhabit spirits. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the center of the earth is an actual cavern, a hole down deep in the earth where these spirits are, but we might not be able to hear them or see them mm -hmm. in our physical eye, but in the spirit realm, you, you could. You mentioned a few verses. Can you give us a few verses for that, for the, the hell? You mentioned about 40 verses. Can you give us some of the, the, the main verses that indicate that hell right now yeah. is in the center of the earth? Ezekiel 26, 20 says, When I shall bring thee down with them that descend into the pit with the people of old time and set thee in the low part of the earth in places desolate of old with them that go down into the pit. And number 16, 32 and 33 says, uh, with the men of Korah, it said, The earth opened her mouth and uh -huh. swallowed them alive, and they all went down alive into Sheol. So that's pretty clear. It's a fast trip. <laughs> and many verses say, Hell from beneath. Isaiah 14, now hell from beneath is moved to meet thee. Uh, Amos 9, 2, though I dig into hell. So he, he's, it's like a, you can't really dig into hell, but he's making reference like it's down deep in the earth. Uh, Jesus descended to the lower parts of the earth, you know, and so forth. There's many scriptures about being in the lower part of the earth. So. Wow. Um, yeah. Coming uh, to, to the end, anything else that you want to mention or maybe uh, any questions that you've heard from interest or a common question uh, Ivan you had a, you have a question or we're just gonna open up for about a few minutes because I want him to also give a call for salvation for anybody that's watching uh, last four minutes and so if you have a question uh, raise your hand this is a kind of a difficult question I think but in the Old Testament when Saul uh, you know David and Saul and Saul uh, with with the witch of mm -hmm. witch of Endor yeah brought up Samuel mm -hmm. my question is oh uh, was that a deceiving spirit that Samuel uh, appeared or they actually pulled the spirit of Samuel back from wherever Samuel was? No, most of the commentaries agree that it was really Samuel coming up because um, it says, um, and, and he said, it didn't say the spirit said, and Samuel said, it says it in two places. But yeah, and, and if, it was, if it was a spirit, that, that would be a lie because it says, and Samuel said. So the, the, the Bible's recording it exactly what happened. Also, he predicted exactly what was going to happen. And a devil wouldn't have known that exactly. The next day, you and your sons will be here with me. Yeah. You know how in Lazarus, that parable is saying that, uh, that no one can come from that place. Right. So how was Samuel taken up from wherever he was? Um, like, well, he didn't cross over to the other side. He was just taken up. It said he ascended up out of the earth. That's another one, proof that it's down deep in the earth. It said he ascended up out of the earth. So God is the one that allowed it. So God just overrode the demon or the witch because she was startled. She didn't expect that. She expected a lying spirit, and she knew uh, that's Samuel because he's clothed in a, uh, she described his clothing that, that, that a, a prophet would wear. Thank so you. she was startled about it. So it, that was really, God allowed that situation, and then, and he predicted exactly right. He was there the next day with his, all his sons. Mm -hmm. So basic, um, so as you said, demons and everybody, um, all the underground people, they come to lie, kill, and um, destroy. My dad told me that Satan himself could deceive people, come in as angels, something magnificent. Could it be a possibility that uh, Satan could come up to heaven, dis be deceived as an angel, but take somebody from heaven, put them, and take them down from heaven? No, no. God would never allow that. I mean, God's in control. He's not going to let a deceiving spirit take one of his kids. And is that what you're asking? That would be impossible. God loves his children, and he protects us all. He would never let a, a deceptive 
demon into heaven to steal one of his children. No, impossible. So we're there forever and ever, and we're in his eternal glory. Amen. Anybody else? Question back there. There, there, there. Go ahead. Um, I was just curious to, what was your perception of time when you were in the vision, if it felt longer than 23 minutes or shorter than 23 minutes? Good question. You know, I felt like I was there for 23 weeks. I mean, I, I literally felt like 23 minutes was equal to 23. It might be the same, the time. I don't know if it's any different, but it just felt that way because just imagine putting your finger, your hand in a fire, in a flame. Five seconds would seem like a long time to hold it there. So it, it seemed like 23 weeks, but I was so physically exhausted in those 23 minutes that it seemed like I hadn't gone to sleep for 23 weeks. But I, I don't know for sure. It's a good question. Somebody's on YouTube asking, can Satan show hell to people? I, I, he wouldn't. I mean, why would he? I, I don't think he can anyway. Uh, he doesn't have those kind of powers, I don't believe. But why would he even want to show hell to somebody? He's deceptive. He wants to appear as the angel of light. That's good. That's good. After both of your out-of-body experiences, did you have more demonic activity in your life? Or did you feel like the presence of God more? No, I've never had demonic activity in my life before or after. I've never had any. And I, that wasn't really demonic activity. It was God just showing me hell. You know, and Acts 2.17 says, In the last days, your young men shall dream dreams. Your, your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. So God was just fulfilling his word. So he has to give people dreams and visions because he said he would in his word. I'm just one of the many. There's many people that have seen it, but it wasn't demonic activity in a sense. I observed it, but I've never been involved in anything demonic. You know, stay away from all that. Keep anything demonic out of your house. Um, how would you explain hell to someone? Because some people believe that like earth, like it's, oh, it's hell on earth. You know, because some people do see horrific things here. But, like, how would you tell someone that, no, this isn't hell? You know, some people do go through some horrible things in, in, on the earth, even Christian missionaries that are suffering horribly and tortured. So I can understand why people would think that. But that's just one thing they'd be enduring, which is bad, not to belittle any of that. But it's no comparison to hell because every, you're experiencing every horrible thing. You're, you're in the dark. You're being tormented by demons. You're experiencing fire. You're hungry. You're thirsty. You never get to sleep. You're hearing the loud screams. You're smelling the stench. You can't breathe. There's not enough air. So all these things and every cell in your body hurts because God is involved in every cell division in our body because he's life. And there's no life in hell, so your whole body hurts. If you have a disease, it's usually only one part of it hurting. Not your entire body. So their whole body is in agony all the time. So it's no comparison to hell. I hope that clarifies. I have, uh, <clears throat> I have two questions. Sure. Why is um, forgiveness available for like us humans but not the angels? And, um, Good question. You, and did you see Satan? Number one, I didn't see Satan. I saw many demons. But first of all, Man was deceived by Satan. Satan was not deceived. He knew what he was doing in heaven. He rebelled against God. So there's no chance for him to ever be... Uh, that God didn't die for him. He, di he died for man. We're made in God's image. Angels are not made in God's image. So God did not die for angels. He died for man. And Satan is without excuse. He was not deceived. He was the deceiver. Okay, so that, that's why. Does that help? Good questions. These guys are all smart. Um, how, okay, this is like kind of complicated for me to say, but I've had a vision before, or at least I believe it was a vision, because I've never seen anything like it. Um, but from then, it's, it was like kind of scary, like after it. But how did you recover from it? Because it's, it's like you're in aftershock, basically. Right, a good question. Uh, that's why my wife had prayed and God removed the horror. So I, I recovered in a sense that I had no bad dreams or anything wrong. I just had a real passion, a burden for the lost. And I explained it. Can I take two minutes and explain this? Um, 
This is, I put this analogy in my book to give, get it across to people of how much of a burden I felt for souls. Because now I, I seen hell, I seen people burning, and now you see a crowd of people that mock God, laugh at God, don't believe it's real. I, I, this is how I felt. If you saw you were lying by a swimming pool and some evil men pull up with a big truck and they drain the pool halfway down of water, then they fill the rest of it up with acid. It looks still like water, it's clear, but it's acid. They throw a piece of metal in it and it disintegrates immediately. Then the men drive away with the truck. And you're lying by the pool, you see this, you know they're up to no good. Now you see some children, little kids running around the corner, all seeing the pool and they're running and they're gonna dive into the pool. What would you do? Would you just lay there and say, not my kids, I'm not worried. You wouldn't do that, would you? You would do anything to stop those children because you know what's going to happen to them. As soon as they hit that water, they're dead. A horrible death. So you would, you would tackle them. You'd stop. You'd do anything possible to stop them. That's how I felt with witnessing, that kind of urgency. But I had to calm down. It took me about a year to settle down from that. I actually was that way. I wanted to get in front of everybody and grab them and throw them down the ground. <laughs> you know, but you can't do those things. You gotta... And then the Lord spoke to me one day and said, Bill, you know, you're just the messenger boy. You're not the savior. So you can't save everybody. So that brought a peace to me in realizing all my job is to do is to bring the gospel to the lost. I don't have to convince them. I don't have to make them get saved. Just share the truth with them. If they receive it, fine. Like Jesus said, if they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet and go to the next place. And that's how our attitude has to be. Urgent, but at the same time, deliver the message and be on your way. Does that help? When, when you were in hell, did you remember your past identity? Like, did you remember your name or your family? Oh, yeah, I remembered everything. I thought about my wife up on the earth, and I'll, I'll never see her again. I thought about my life. Little things flash through my mind, you know, going for a nice drive, breathing fresh air, going snow skiing, all the little, little things that you enjoy doing, uh, taking a shower, all those things. Uh, and I knew that was a thing of the past. And so your mind really doesn't escape to that more than a second because you're in torment the whole time and you're in agony and so forth. So. Uh, yeah, I had my memory, just like the rich man in Luke 16. He had his full memory. He thought about his brothers up on the earth. He said he knew if they would repent, they would not have to come there. And he wanted to send back Lazarus to warn them about the place. But that was not going to happen. So anyway, good, good question. Go ahead. Can you explain to me what um, Psalms 139, 8 means then, where it says that if I send up to heaven, you are there, or if I make my bed in Shiloh, then you are there? Yeah, he's saying wherever I'm at, if I go to heaven or I go down to hell, you're there. So God... Well, the Lord is still with us then even if we are in hell? No, it just means his be... eyes are there. His eyes are upon everything. In uh, Proverbs 15, it's in, I forget what verse in 15, it says that the eyes of the Lord are in every place. So God can see all because he's omnipresent. So he's there, wherever you're at, he's there in a sense of seeing. But it says in Proverbs 15, 29, the Lord is far from the wicked. So he's far in heaven, but his eye can see it. Does that make sense? Does it also maybe mean uh, Sheol, the part, the paradise part of Sheol, where, because uh, it speaks of David, and David, uh, you know, he was, a he was a believer in God, because right. he couldn't go to heaven yet until Jesus would pay for the sins. So could it also mean that God was with the believers of the Old Testament. It's a, that's a good point, right. That's a very good point. It could be referring to, because Sheol represented both sides back then. If you said, though I make my bed in Sheol, well, Sheol is also the, the uh, Abraham's bosom side. So he could have been referring to that. But the point is God sees everything. He's everywhere in the sense of seeing. Amen. Amen. Okay, two more questions. Um, I had an experience. Um, okay, so I know like, uh, they call it kind of astral projection. I never knew what to really call it. But um, I was praying and crying out for the kids that were in child sex trafficking in the tunnels down on the ground. And God took me from my body and down there. And I was down there with like babies and all these kids and stuff. Is that the same thing? I mean... You were down there with, and you saw babies? I saw the kids down there that were in the tunnels underground um, 
that were being used to child sex trafficking, and God showed me that they were down there. There was no light. It was only darkness. The, the only light came from my body. And um, so would that be kind of the same well, thing? Well, that's not hell. Right. If, if that was a real vision that you were seeing, then kids might be kept underground somewhere that they're for human trafficking, but that's kids that are alive uh, on the earth. That wasn't hell because there's no children in hell, number one. So that wasn't, I think she was referring hell. about, is it the same way that the Lord shows visions by taking us into different places? Yes. Yes, that's, that's true. If that's a vision, God can show you it that way. Exactly. What is the difference between Hades and Sheol? Hades is just the uh, Greek word, and Sheol is the Hebrew word. So just two different languages. And they yeah. both mean the realm of the... Uh, uh, realm of the dead, realm of the, dead, uh, the uh, realm of the unseen spirits. Okay, that's good for now. I want us to um, take a moment right now, and people who are watching and who will be rewatching, and we have quite a few people that were asking, and I know this is a question that you know we seem to know the answer for, but I want Bill to kind of look at the camera again and explain to somebody and give an opportunity to somebody who is not sure or has not made a decision to make Jesus the Lord of their life. Um, like we heard yesterday, like we heard today, that hell is a default destination of every human being. We don't go to hell, not only Hitler's and Stalin's and the, uh, hit and the you know, Boko Haram and Hamas and like the big terrorists. This is where every person goes who does not, who was born in sin and we were all born in sin. And the only way to get off of this highway of hell is to take the turn toward Christ and so I want Bill to kind of present that gospel um, once again in just a few minutes and lead people to the Lord um, in the center camera you know if you have to make a decision and a non-decision is a decision you have to actually make a decision to receive Jesus and Revelation 2015 says whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire God actually has a book and if you want your name in it, then you have to repent and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and come into your heart. Uh, ask the Father to forgive your sins. And if, if you are willing to do that, all you have to do, and it doesn't matter what you've done, you don't have to clean yourself up. You just come as you are. He loves you, and he'll clean you up. It doesn't matter how bad you have been. God is waiting for you to make the decision. But it's up to you, and you have to choose now. So if you want to do that, Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, unless a man repent, you shall all likewise perish. And that just means you agree to turn away from a sinful lifestyle and agree to follow Jesus. And then just Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So you have to confess him with your own mouth and believe in, in your own heart. If you're willing to do that, then we can pray with you right now. So I'm, I'm going to ask you just... Repeat this after me. Just say, Dear God in heaven, I know I've sinned. I cannot save myself. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. That he was crucified. And he was crucified. Died and was buried. Died and was buried. But he rose again. And he rose again. And lives forevermore. And lives forevermore. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry. I am sorry. I want to follow you. I want to follow you. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. I receive you, Jesus. I receive you, Jesus. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. You are the Son of God. You are the Son of God. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for taking me to heaven now. Take me to heaven now. I now confess. I now confess. I'm a born again Christian. I'm a born again Christian. And I'll serve you. And I'll serve you. All the days of my life. All the days of my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you said that prayer, that's the wisest thing you could ever do. And that means you, you can go to heaven. Not right now, maybe, but you're going to go to heaven. So you don't have to worry about hell, but just serve God with all your heart. Get plugged into a good church because God loves you and he has a plan, a wonderful plan for your life. And if you pray that prayer today, go to hungrygen.com slash VIP. Let us know that you... Um, gave your life to the Lord so we can send you also some materials, connect you to our small groups. And Bill, for people who are interested in 
learning more about your ministry and staying connected with your ministry, what are some of the places they, that they can go? They can go to our website, 23minutesinhell.org or soulchoiceministries.org, S-O-U-L, soulchoiceministries.org, uh, or um, that, uh, what do you call that thing there? QR code. A QR code. You can go there and access all the information. We have all the books, and we have a lot of videos and teachings, and everything's free. You can look at it as far as watching the videos and so forth. And all the video links are on, on the description below. His website, YouTube channel is also tagged in it, so make sure you check it out. Make sure you follow that ministry. And if you have not read or listened to the 23 Minutes in Hell book, you must do that. And then right away, buy a few books so you can give it to somebody else. If this place is a real, even if you don't believe in Christ, but if this is a real, um, it's a gamble, huge gamble that you're taking with eternity. And so for us as Christians, we believe the truth. We believe Jesus Christ is the truth. And he talked about hell more than he talked about other topics. And so we have to live with urgency today. Pray like crazy, serve God like crazy, and witness to people who don't know him. In Jesus' name, amen, and God bless you.